Hello and welcome back to the second half of the third video. So far we've constructed church numerals together with simple arithmetic operations as well as booleans, logical connectives and simple predicates. The goal for this video is to recursively define the factorial function. The factorial of a natural number n is defined as follows. If n is 0, the factorial function returns 1. In all other cases it returns n times factorial of n minus 1. With our previous definitions, we can express most of this in the lambda calculus already. The term has the number n as its only input. To check if n is 0, we can use our predicate is 0. And depending on the result of is 0, which will be a boolean value, we return 1 if is 0 returns true, and n times factorial of the predecessor of n otherwise. We choose to write 1 for the first church numeral instead of c1, as it's more intuitive to read, and this 1 plays a more constant role in this term than an input cn does. So, when we apply this term to some church numeral later, we're going to use the cn notation, but this 1 is going to stay like this. The problem with this definition is that we can't use fact inside its own definition, since fact is not a valid lambda term. It's just a name that stands for the term that you see here, so we would have to insert lambda n dot is 0 and so on for the name fact, but this would yield fact in the term again, which is to be expected since this is a recursive definition. Inserting the term for fact again and again and again would yield an infinitely long lambda term, which is not allowed by our definition. To deal with this, we can use self-application. So we can't use self-reference, but the term should appear again and again in itself. We've already seen an example of a term appearing over and over, big omega, which was the term lambda x dot xx applied to lambda x dot xx. It was better convertible to itself and itself only because of the self-application xx and the fact that we applied the same terms to one another. So we want to achieve that fact is convertible to lambda n dot is zero n applied to one and mult n applied to factorial of predecessor of n. The idea is just the same as with omega. For fact to be equivalent to a helper function fact prime applied to itself. So fact prime applied to fact prime. And this helper function will work with self-application to reproduce itself. Since we know that fact is equivalent to fact prime applied to fact prime, we can insert that into the term. And as so many times before, we can take the term fact prime, undo a better reduction, and take fact prime out of the term. This yields an additional abstraction with an arbitrary variable, let's say f, and fact prime as an input. Now, this is a valid lambda term, with no self-reference, which might lead to an infinitely long term. The only information still missing is what fact prime looks like. If you remember, fact is equivalent to fact prime applied to itself. So we can just take this long term, which uses self-application as the term in big omega did, and set it as fact prime. The factorial function in the untyped lambda calculus is therefore defined with a helper function fact prime. Fact prime makes use of self-application, so it takes the term f as an input and uses it in place of fact from the previous definition. If one now applied fact prime to itself, this f applied to f reduces to fact prime applied to fact prime, which is fact by definition. Therefore, with the help of self-application, we got rid of the problem of self-reference, which can result in infinitely long lambda terms, which are not part of the calculus. Now that we've achieved exactly the construct that we were looking for, we only have to check whether our initial idea for the factorial function works. We're going to prove this by induction. For the base case, we compute the factorial of c0. In this case, we expect the result to be 1. We're not going to cover the first two reduction steps in great detail, but as you can see in the third step, since is0 of c0 reduces to true, and true returns its first argument, the whole term reduces to 1. This is to be expected. In our base case, we can completely ignore any computations of any predecessors as we know that it's just going to return 1. Very well, now for the recursive step. We have to compute the factorial of a church numeral n greater than 0. So we apply factorial to cn. This time, the term should reduce to n times the factorial of its predecessor. After reducing the f and x red x, we arrive at the fourth line. We get is 0 of cn applied to 1 and the recursive case. This time is 0 n reduces to false since n is not 0. And we get a second input which is the multiplication of n with fact prime applied to fact prime and the predecessor of n. As we know, fact prime applied to fact prime is just factorial and therefore we get multiplication of cn with the factorial of its predecessor in the end. So as we've seen, one way to achieve recursion is by passing a copy of the recursive function to itself. This works quite well, 
but there's a more elegant way to do this, using a so-called fixed point operator. You're probably familiar with the notion of a fixed point of a function f. A fixed point is an argument x that can be given to f and is mapped to itself. f of x equals x. With this follows that f of f of f of f of f and so on of f of x equals x too. This is an important termination property, especially when we want to compute f recursively. The fixed point of the function x squared, for example, would be zero. Of course, mathematical functions can have more than one fixed point, or no fixed point at all. Consider, for example, the simple function f of x equals x plus 1. This function doesn't have a fixed point, as x plus 1 is never going to equal x. In the lambda calculus, however, every function has a fixed point. This is stated by the so-called fixed point theorem. For every possible lambda term m, there exists a term p, such that m applied to p is better convertible to m again. The proof for this is quite simple. For a given lambda term m, we let p be this term which resembles the term big omega that we saw in the first two videos. We apply lambda x dot the lambda term m applied to xx to itself. If we better reduce this term, we have to substitute the two occurrences of x by the whole lambda x dot mxx term. So we get m applied to lambda x dot mxx applied to lambda x dot mxx. If we look closely, we can see that the long term that m is applied to is exactly the definition for the fixed point p. Although it might seem like we just magically put the term m in front, we actually only computed a self-applying function. And we already finished the proof. We were able to show that p is better convertible to m applied to p. So what can we do with this fixed point? First we can see that the fixed point looks the same for every lambda term m just by inserting the m at the right point. This indicates that we can create a term which on input m returns its fixed point. Such a function is called a fixed point combinator. A combinator is simply a lambda term without any free variables. A fixed point combinator is a higher order function that returns the fixed point to a given function if one exists. Higher order just means that it can take functions as an input. Normally, mathematical functions operate on numbers. In programs, functions might even operate on strings or other constant objects. Those values or objects are called lower order elements. Functions are higher order elements because they are depending on lower order elements which they take as their input. Low order functions can only operate on lower order elements. Higher order functions also operate on higher order elements. So a fixed point combinator is a lambda term without any free variables, which can take low order elements and high order elements like functions as its input. And it returns a fixed point of a given function. Now would be a good point to pause the video for a minute and try to construct the wanted combinator. Again, it should take a function as an input and return the corresponding p term that we discovered a slide before. We're going to call this term the y combinator and it looks like follows. It takes a variable f, which will be a function as an input, and it puts it at the spot where the term m was in the term p of the fixed point theorem. Again, feel free to pause the video again and compare this y combinator to that term. The proof that this y actually returns the fixed point for any given term is quite straightforward. We take y applied to g, and we expect it to be better convertible to g applied to yg. With this, y applied to g would be a fixed point of g. First, we write out the y combinator and get this long term. If we now reduce the f red x, we have to substitute these two occurrences of f by the variable g, and with this, we get the fixed point of g that we constructed in the fixed point theorem. So after the next reduction step, which we execute in the same way as in the fixed point theorem proof, we already finished the proof of this lemma. y applied to g is better convertible to g applied to yg. So y is indeed a term that returns the fixed point of a given input function and doesn't contain any free variables. Therefore, it's a fixed point combinator. Notice that we could continue better reducing the term y applied to g, which will always result in g applied to yg. So with each reducing step, we get one more application of g in the term. That being the case, we also proved that the fixed point term doesn't have a better normal form. This is to be expected, since we looked at the fixed point combinator with the goal of creating recursion. Let's now get back to the factorial function and see how we can make use of the y combinator, or any fixed point combinator for that matter, to achieve recursion. As a quick reminder, this is what the recursive definition of the factorial function looked like. To avoid confusion with the second definition that we construct now, we're going to rename these two functions to factorial prime r and factorial r. 
To use the Y Combinator, we only have to modify our definition of factorial prime very slightly. Up until now, we passed f to itself. In this version, we're not going to do that. We're just going to use f once. And in the definition of fact, instead of passing factorial prime to itself, we apply the Y Combinator to factorial prime. Again, it's quite easy to check that this gives us exactly what we expect the factorial function to do. It returns 1 if the input is 0, and otherwise it multiplies n with the factorial of n minus 1. Feel free to check the computations. So, we've seen that we're able to define numbers, simple and more complex arithmetic operations, booleans and control flows in the lambda calculus. Recursive definitions are also possible. This leaves us with the unanswered question about the computational power of the lambda calculus. Can we actually define everything possible, meaning every Turing computable function? And actually, yes, we can. In 1936, Alonso Church invented the lambda calculus in an attempt to build a logically consistent system as a foundation of mathematics, and to define a notion of computability. Around the same time, Alan Turing introduced a formal definition of a computing machine, nowadays widely known as a Turing machine, which resulted in the universal term Turing computable function. Along with those theories, both independently demonstrated that the Entscheidungsproblem, and with that the halting problem, are not effectively decidable. If you want to learn more about the history and correspondence of different definitions of computability, we strongly recommend the lecture Propositions as Types by Philip Wadler. It's a brilliant talk about the, quote, hilarious subject of computability theory. And among other topics, it also provides an overview of the lambda calculus from a different angle than ours. It can be found on YouTube and it's freely accessible. So we're going to link it for you in the literature section as well as the corresponding paper. Whenever a system is powerful enough to define every Turing computable function, it's called Turing complete. Many systems have been proven to be Turing complete and are therefore equivalent counterparts to Turing computable functions, including mu recursive functions and the terms of the untyped lambda calculus. A proof of the Turing completeness of the lambda calculus can be found in Barendrecht 1991. So with only three rules and a definition for computation, we're able to construct every Turing computable function. So let's summarize all of the achievements and downsides of the untyped lambda calculus. The lambda calculus is simple and easy to define, yet it's also powerful enough to construct every Turing definable function. But it contains functions that have the tendency of running into an infinite loop of computations. So there's functions that don't terminate. In programming, this is something that one would usually like to avoid. Additionally, every lambda term has a fixed point. Although this might be a nice theoretical property, it contradicts the usual behavior of mathematical functions. Even simple functions like f of x equals x plus 1 don't have a fixed point. So this descent is quite unsatisfactory. And the last and most important downside is that the untyped lambda terms can't interpret a fundamental property of functions. They can't map from a specified domain to a corresponding fixed codomain. Functions normally require a specific type of input to produce the required output. The factorial of a negative function is not defined. The same holds for the square root if we're in the range of real numbers. And if you remember the small omega term where the input is applied to itself, it's still obscure what happens if one would input a number. And even more so if one defines functions on strings, lists, etc., where giving other objects as an input wouldn't make much sense. We can and will tackle this problem by introducing types into the lambda calculus. At first, we're going to add very simple types, which yields the simply type lambda calculus. This system will have none of the mentioned disadvantages, but it's going to be quite restricted and definitely not close to Turing complete. So to gain more computational power, we're going to take the simply type lambda calculus as a base, and we're going to gradually add more and more different types into it. This will result in systems with many different properties that can be combined and will even lead up to the calculus of constructions. But for now, we've just finished the untyped lambda calculus, and we're going to look at simple types in the next few videos. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next videos.